Hi, I'm Lynn Davis, and welcome to Discussions on Democracy. I'm program manager for a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization called Healthy Democracy that designs and coordinates innovative, deliberative democracy programs. We're partnering with the City of Eugene to facilitate a first of its kind review panel. The issue up for deliberation is the implementation of HB 2001, a bill passed by the Oregon legislature in 2019 that mandates all cities in Oregon expand the types of housing they allow in single family zones. Our goal in partnering with the city is, as always, unbiased, high quality public engagement. The panel has already been selected through a randomized lottery based process that helps ensure broad, accurate representation. The review panel has also already started its first round of meetings, and it's a wonderful, diverse panel of residents eager to engage on this issue. The purpose of this show, Discussions on Democracy, is to explain the process we're going through. This is the fourth in the series, and in this episode we'll be exploring the panelist experience from two different points of view. Our first guest is Kelly Coates, who is Operations Manager for Healthy Democracy. She helps the selected panelists with just about anything they might need during the process. Everything from Zoom training to providing laptops to emotional support. She's going to help explain what goes into ensuring that panelists have the support they need to carry out the very important and sometimes demanding work of deliberation. Then we're going to hear from an actual panelist named Jeremy, who served on two different panels that Healthy Democracy facilitated. His first panel experience was in 2019 for the Milwaukee Citizen Jury and in 2020 for the Oregon Citizen Assembly Pilot Project. Kelly Coates, welcome to Discussions on Democracy. Hi, Lynn. Thanks for having me. <laughs> nice to have you here. So we talk a lot about sort of the panel being on the dais or in a place of honor or otherwise sort of respected as someone, as, a, as an entity that we are serving as support staff mm -hmm. rather than them serving us with information or something like that. And I wanted to first ask you how that sort of plays out in, in conversations before the panel even starts. I think it starts, I mean, it starts from the second that they get that very first letter or that piece of correspondence from us inviting them to be a part of this experience. And we want them to recognize that this is something different than what they think they may know or that they've ever experienced before. Um, because it's an invitation to be a part of this. Um, it's not a mandate like a jury summons or a even a focus group necessarily that it's really them bringing their expertise to the table and so we've over time even modified some of the processes that we've used to create this space for them where we um, acknowledge for example when we first get their response to say that they're in interested in being a part of this and so we will um, thank them and say, you know, here's where you are. Stay tuned. There's more to come. We're getting, this will get more exciting from here. Um, and then, and then of course that proceeds as they're selected and there's additional conversations that happen. I think that the, the intention though, throughout the entire process from the very beginning all the way through, um, is to make sure that they feel comfortable, that this doesn't, this isn't something that they've experienced before. We don't expect it to be something that they've experienced before. And we want them to have a friendly voice, a friendly person on the other end to help with that sort of easing of the comfort, I think, if you will. Yeah. Now, you've probably talked to more panelists or prospective panelists than maybe anybody in the history of the organization. Uh, what do people tell you when you first pick up the phone to call them, for example, to, to tell them that they've just been selected? This assumes that they pick up my phone call. Um, because that Fair. often happens. They're getting a phone call from a number they don't recognize. They, um, I had one gentleman hang up on me four times before I find, and I kept redialing, um, and then finally got him on the phone. But to even get through that initial, you know, hi, my name is Kelly Coates, and I'm with Healthy Democracy, the organization that, you know, it's a lot to get through. Um, and they, but so I think that one of the main sort of pieces that they're most trepidatious about is in this influx of scam calls and spam information that we receive, both email, phone, all of these different things, that they are, they're, 
there's a lot of nervousness. And so that initial phone call is one of welcome, one of excitement, one of congratulations, one of you have been selected to encourage them to feel um, comfortable, to know that they're a part of something that could be really, really cool. Um, and then to be able to answer some of those qu other questions, like, are you sure that this is legit? And, you know, so constantly referring them to our resources to say, you're not, um, this is not something that is happening in a weird vacuum, that this is, you know, giving them those resources that can kind of help them find that out for themselves. Yeah. Do you ever feel like there's sort of a balance in some ways between like projecting an air of gravitas of, of the process but mm -hmm. yet also not making it feel intimidating? I think so. I think that they, um, because I do want them to know that they're a part of something really cool. I do want them to know it's also something that is being taken really seriously. And the story that I often share is that um, it's very similar, that these are big questions that in it may be a city government or a state that this group is wrestling with and they know that they could they have a whole bunch of different ways that they could get answers to their question and they could just as easily the the main um, analogy I often draw from is the one of the town hall like we could have a town hall meeting which is also a legitimate way to bring voices to the table but in general the folks who attend are either super excited about it or they're super frustrated by it whatever it is and that the purpose of this process is to bring in everyone else's voices, that they often have opinions they may not even realize yet. They have knowledge that they're bringing to the table. They have experience that they're bringing to the table. So it is that emphasis on this is important. You're doing something that is critical for a host of reasons. And it's also, um, we're going to make it as fun as possible. We're going to make it as easy as possible because you are the ones with the expertise. We're going to hear, we're here to help you through this process. Um, so if that means there's, you know, there's the flights that I've had to arrange for people, there's ground transportation to those that are more local, but it's arranging meals and, and making sure that we're accommodating different dietary preferences. We want to remove as many barriers as possible so that they can feel like they have a seat at this table that is important, that is valuable, and that we are so excited that they're there. So that's a great point, Kelly. Let's talk about some of the accessibility f features um, of our programs, because that's sort of a core value of ours for the in-person programs when we can do that again. Uh, we offer food, lodging, you mentioned transportation, um, elder and child care at home, in addition to paying a stipend, of course, um, typically around the, the average wage of a worker in, in whatever state we're working in. And, but we also do things for, for these processes online now as well that are hopefully sort of um, really make it possible for anybody, no matter what their sort of level of technological uh, skill or comfort to participate, like providing the loaner laptops, um, webcams, hotspots, um, and personalized tech support. We've, we've, um, we've definitely had a host of them. So for some of our more local events that were in person, it was the person who didn't have a car who would need to take a couple of different buses to get there each day. We've had, um, for one that was a statewide event in California, I was coordinating um, air flights for folks who were wanting to fly out of certain airports. The one that was most challenging was it was a young woman who had never been on an airplane before and did not want to be on an airplane. So we arranged for, I think it was a train trip that took something like 16 hours, but she was willing to do it because she wanted to be a part of it. Um, so there was those that are just more logistically challenging. And then if you move into this online space where we're occupying with the various events that we have done, um, there has been... Um, mostly related to technological issues that it's I don't have a computer. I don't have internet. My internet is really is sketchy at best. And so it's working with those individuals to um, help them in the process of getting, you know, brought up up to speed to where they can actively participate. And um, there's a person that we work with who helps with a lot of those more challenging tech issues. And um, she made a comment the other day. She said, I've just, I've learned that I have to talk, I have to speak the language they're comfortable with. So if I say, how do you download something? She was like, I don't download things. But then it was like, well, how do you play games on your phone? And she was like, oh, oh, I do that. Like I, so 
So it's that it's recognizing the commonality that we share more and we have more in common with folks than I think we give credit to. And it's just speaking that sort of common language to make them feel comfortable, to make them feel like this is a very approachable process. Um, and that's even the purpose of doing with these online sessions of like a Zoom sort of tech check, if you will, of getting them to feel um, familiar so that that very first time sitting down at the computer does not feel overwhelming. It doesn't as much as possible. I mean, if with the in-person ones, you're still walking into a room for the first time. You're still nervous. You're meeting brand new people. You're in a brand new space. It's, it doesn't matter if you're going on a first date or if you're coming to one of our sessions for the first time. It's nerve wracking. Um, and it can be just as nerve wracking, I think, even if you're sitting in your own living room or an office or your, your bedroom. Um, you're still meeting people and it's unfamiliar. And so I think that element of providing comfort so that they can let down some of that nervousness helps them to feel like they're in a space where they can contribute meaningfully. So let's talk about one more thing, which is the sort of challenges. You mentioned a couple things that people say to you when you first get on the phone with them, if you're able to get on the phone with them. Um, what are what are what are the most common kind of concerns or fears of folks that you talk to who might be just selected for a panel? I think by far and away the biggest challenge or hurdle that I often help people get over is not feeling um, not feeling like they're going to be smart enough for this or not feeling like they know enough about whatever the topic is to have a say. And it's by virtue of them being a resident in the space, a citizen in a space, a whatever that definition is with the project we're working on to say, no, you live in the city of Milwaukee. That's all we need you to be. We, we need you to just be you in this space. Um, there's, I've talked with some um, panelists who have said, well, I'm a researcher by nature. So where do I need to go so that I know what we're talking about on that first day? And there's absolutely some things I can give them to kind of help them feel a little, it's again, it's about comfort. So if that person needs information initially to feel comfortable, great. Um, but it's the reminder for most people to say, you are not expected to have done homework on this. You are not expected to have been an expert on this. You are not being asked to know everything about whatever this topic is. In fact, there's no test. There's no, there's no quiz. Um, it is you, with your lived experience, having something to say about whatever this topic is. And we think that this is, um, that that is the most important thing you bring into the room. Let's talk a little bit about some, a few personal stories. I know I've interacted with some panelists, you've interacted with a lot more, but I was just thinking about, you know, having a conversation sort of like that with somebody who was on the panel in, in 2016 in Oregon. Uh, for the Citizens Initiative Review that year. And it was a young woman who was maybe in her early 20s, I wanna say, if that, and felt really hesitant about being there even once she had arrived and, and felt like she kind of didn't belong. And um, sort of by the nature of all the ages represented in the room, she was definitely at the younger end. And I remember right off, you know, near the beginning, her, her talking about, oh, I, I feel like I should, I should just go home. I don't think I have much to contribute. And, and of course, like a couple of us and moderators kind of talked to her and the support staff at the time. And she ended up saying, okay, I'll give it another day, you know. And by the end was like, absolutely like one of, you know, in the, in the mix, in every group and in the full group and asking questions and like, mm -hmm. right, you know, right there contributing and was like, oh, I'm so happy I stayed. Uh, mm -hmm. But at first it was like, wow, this is, this is intimidating. Um, and I wonder if you have had any sort of stories like that where, where, where somebody's perception of, of the thing has, has shifted and you've witnessed that. I think that there's been, I can think of numerous examples of this happening in different sort of ways. Um, and it's interesting because it most often sort of sits at the two ends of the age spectrum that either individuals who are very young are like, what do I have to contribute? I, I don't know these things. Um, this is not a topic I'm familiar with. We've done a couple of these panels around issues related to housing. So they feel like they just don't know enough. Um, all the way to then on the other end of the spectrum, I feel like it's folks who are a little bit older who are, um, in our kind of 75 plus crowd who say, I don't, what am I going to contribute? I've, I've lived my life, I've, I've done my things and I don't have a lot to add. 
Um, and then those are the folks that tend to be, in both cases, often looked to for the answers. That we have these sage generations who have wisdom and thoughts and feedback about life and the way that life should be or could be based on all of these experiences that they have. And then they look to the younger group for the future and the potential for tomorrow. It's not to say that the folks in the middle don't have something to contribute because they absolutely do. I think they, in many cases, often already feel sort of prepared to provide that. They work in spaces where their input is, is being taken on a regular basis. Um, they're already a part of whether they may be a part of a family. And so they're, they're constantly giving feedback to partners or children and they're a part of the, that kind of dialogue. It tends to be sort of those other two ends of the spectrum that often feel um, like they're just not sure where their value is in this and then quickly realize, interestingly enough, that the panel often looks to them because of these two different sort of, you know, like lots of lived experience as well as um, so much um, eagerness and youth and, and future in, that they possess and, and then quickly they feel sort of at ease. Um, there's been many, many conversations though with folks that say, I don't think I'm going to have anything to contribute. I don't know why you would choose me. I just live my life and I don't know what I can do to add to what you're asking. And it's that reminder of you occupying a space and whatever space that is related to this topic is all we're asking for you to do. Like that's all you need to do ahead of time. Um, realizing of course that some people, like I said earlier, feel more comfortable wanting to like draw from research or other pieces that they're doing, um, you're, you know, so they can feel more comfortable when they walk in the door, but the understanding that that is not a requirement to be here. And um, yeah, and then realizing over the course of this period of time, even if they're not the most vocal of participants, because many people are more introverted by nature, that they can draw into themselves and bring out some really beautiful moments, I think, as a part of the panel. Oh, love it. Well, that seems like a good point to bring in our other guest today, uh, who will both have a chance to talk to you, Jeremy, um, a former panelist on two different uh, panels over the summer, the, the Oregon uh, Citizen Assembly on COVID policy, and about a year ago in late 2019, um, our first city level citizen jury, we called it at the time, now a citizen review panel. Um, in Milwaukee, Oregon. Jeremy, thank you so much for being here. Hi guys, thanks, it's good to be here. Awesome, uh, now let's, let's take a step back actually first to sort of where I started with Kelly, which was sure. what, when you first received a piece of mail from us mm. in Milwaukee in that project, what did you think of it? Can you take us back to your first impressions <laughs> of getting that envelope or post? -card? Yeah, sure, uh, well my wife received the mail um, so she showed me, um, the letter and, uh, yeah, she was like, this is your chance. You should get out there and go give your opinion to somebody. <laughs> so yeah, I saw it as a, as an opportunity to, uh, go talk to, um, other folks. I thought it was a big plus that it was actually like my city. Um, so it wasn't so broad range. It was actually like we had, um, you know, neighborhood connections together and stuff. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, my wife checked the mail, I signed up within the day or two, put it back in the mail. And then, um, yeah, luckily enough, I got chose um, to be on that panel about a year ago now. And uh, yeah, it was just exciting. I think that would probably sum it all up. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, that, yeah. I, thought, I thought that was definitely a scam. You didn't have yeah. that reaction. Yeah, I mean, I think everything's a scam. That's wow. why I don't check the mail. <laughs> like, just to be kind of like neutral. I do have like a barrier in front of me in the outside world, sort of. So it's my wife. She does all the mail checking. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, she she's like, this is right up your alley, you know, because like in general, like I, I always kind of talk about uh, with my friends as well, how to be more actively engaged, right? How to go beyond just potion, posting your emotions on social media outlets or, or just complaining about all your friends to like, you know, whatever kind of policy problem you have, like what is the next step where communities and, um, or, or where communities can organize and then get out there and start actually, um, you know, participating and then engaging and then hopefully seeing some actions happen. And so, yeah, it's just exciting. That's why I see the exciting part about it. Oh, that's interesting. And did you see that sort of side of it from the very beginning, like you, like from from the letter, or did it take sort of being in the room and being a part of it 
to be like, oh yeah, this is this feels like this feels different somehow. Right. Yeah, it actually didn't probably that probably started taking effect once we got in the room. Um, when I received a letter, I was kind of um, just questioning it, questioning the process, of course, um, but uh, happy to try it out, so to speak. And and uh, I think it really started making the connections of this could be the future of how uh, you, know, you know we have a healthy democracy uh, moving forward. You know, it's it's just like it's getting people in a room or getting people online face to face in a in a in a format where we can connect with people and understand that people on the other side of of the computer screen are actually people. And so that way we aren't raging against each other so hard. Um, I, I, I kind of saw it like that as, as we were evolving. I think, I think that first session was about, was like four or five days. Um, so um, yeah, like within the, the first day I noticed everybody was kind of like eh, shy. I was still kind of shy. Like what if I go in here and start talking like, you know, might some crazy things happen, but uh, you know, the good news is, is everybody loosens up second and third day into it. Um, and then you start getting to see what people are really about, see, seeing how they feel about certain matters and, and uh, are able to open up and have conversations um, once they get comfortable. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question is when you came into the room, like you knew sort of by design, this is a panel of folks, some of whom you're probably gonna disagree with. Like that's literally how people are selected, you know, yeah. that, in that process, we use political party as a, as a thing and, you know, along yeah. with a whole bunch of other demographics. And did you feel like nervous about that at all? Or were you like kind of curious or what was your sort of feeling about it going in? Yeah, not me, man. I'm pretty used to <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty used to just, just kind of being honest and working on teams and working on projects and my and kind of like my professional life who we are just honest and, and just everybody has an opinion. Everybody wants to play and everybody wants to work together to accomplish something greater than something that can be done by themselves. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I guess I wasn't really too, too afraid of, uh, of being, uh, I guess, scared of my opinions or, or, or uh, I guess the proper way to be like fearful of how others would take, um, take what I would suggest. Um, and in some cases it would become like, I wouldn't just suggest it because I feel this way. I would suggest it because I feel the conversation is getting stale. And so I want to throw out this idea that maybe gets other people excited to like, Oh, this is my idea about that. Or, Oh, I just hate that. I think that's just stupid. You know, just trying to engage others and like kind of get some emotion reactions out of it. Um, so for me personally, I, 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 that's just my world. I love to play in. I love to be the observer. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I could see totally, it's just taking, taking a, a, a little bit of time for people to get warmed up. And then once the gates open, it, it feels like people can just be comfortable talking about anything and, and talk about how they feel and everybody's accepting of, oh, this person feels different than, than I do. Or, or, you know, we all have our differences. We all come from different, um, life backgrounds and, and stuff. So, so everybody's going to be a little different and, uh, you know, what I found was just people were accepting of that. And of course, that that was that was the city one that I felt more accepting. And then when we went to the state level, I felt like there was a lot more broader range of folks on, on that because it was, um, you know, extreme differences in, in cultures. So it was like you got the city folks talking to the country folks, the folks that live on the, the coast, you know, with the people that live in the desert and everybody's got all these hundreds of problems and none of them were the same and there's not going to be one solution to fix it. And so there it's, it felt like, okay, this is going to take a little bit more working to get through um, because you opened up, you opened up a broader range of uh, people to talk to. And uh, yeah. So. Interesting. Uh, yeah. You talked about sort of how it takes a little bit of time for people to get used to each other. And Kelly mentioned mm -hmm. that like that, especially people that are maybe older or younger, as she mentioned, like, can feel a little bit less comfortable at first and then and then are then kind of called on to be these like voices of wisdom from from one end of the spectrum or another uh did you notice that like can you think of any any examples of folks that where, where you were like you know that you sort of noticed people sort of breaking out of their shell at, at some point <laughs> yeah breaking out of their shell and and staying into it at the same time i think um <laughs> One uh, thing that just really sticks out is uh, the last one that we did over the summer was with the COVID situation. We were talking a lot about how to get kids back into school. And so you had the, the elder generation talking about um, really pushing about how important it is for people to show up to class, be engaged socially with each other and, you know, get out there and, and basically, you know, live life what we call normal. And um, the younger folks were talking about 
and, and me included, was uh, like, is this the way to step into the, the new style of education, which doesn't limit uh, your, it doesn't limit your education to the area that you're in. Uh, for example, if we were doing online classes, teachers from around the nation could work together to make sure students had enough um, engagement, like personal face-to-face -face engagement, um, that, that they, they didn't feel left behind. Maybe they got better teaching. Maybe they were able to talk to astronauts on Friday. Maybe they were able to talk to some other um, firefighter or police officer that was on the other side of the country. Or, you know, there's all these kind of fun new things you can do with education and, and new technology or where we're at with technology right now. And I felt that the younger people were pushing for that, but then the, the older folks um, were, were pretty resistant against that because they feel like you have to be in person to have a people connection, which I think is the difference between, um, you know, like I would say that our generation, my generation, I was born in the eighties. So like, you know, we had life before the internet and then the internet came out in our late teenage years. And then after that, we know what life is with the internet now. And so, um, you know, you get a lot of that. Everybody pre-internet feels like you got to be in person to have these like personal engagements. And then, you know, now everybody's like, you know, walking down the street on their phone. So they're so interconnected um, that uh, it just feels natural for a lot of folks these days to, uh, to engage in technology and, and, you know, utilize that as an education tool. Um, me personally, I was practically a dropout of high school and I didn't learn anything from college and I never went except for to go party with my friends and whatnot. But I used the internet as a tool to constantly learn. I mean, even to this point and to this day, to this morning, I was learning something about something that I'm interested in that will, you know, constantly just push the envelope and keep moving forward. So, yeah. Now let's go off on that a little bit. You were part of two panels, as I mentioned, and people might be wondering how that could be because we randomly select, but in fact, this panel over the summer, the Citizen Assembly um, pilot on COVID was a, a very shortened kind of demonstration project in a way. And, and for part of the panel, we actually put a call out to folks who had previously responded to, to uh, panels in the past. And you answered the call and along with a number of folks. And then the other half of the panel was totally randomly selected from the general public. But it sort of gave us this little bit of window into like, well, now there are some folks who've done something not online and done something online and also you did something that was like four full days long and then this process over the summer was only about 14 total hours i think so something like a little less than two days really if it was full days uh how do you feel like the experience between those was different in terms of like online versus offline and in terms of like the amount of time that you spent with folks well, there's a lot of differences. Um, I felt like once we connected, uh, for example, the COVID was once a week, we connected for two hours a week. Um, and uh, I think it was two hours, maybe it was three hours, two hours. Um, yeah, two hours. Yeah, yeah. So I felt like there was a period of time where we had to ramp up and like reconnect with what we were talking about last week. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so so there was a little bit of difference in, 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 uh, in how and, and kind of like what I was going back to, I guess, is how quickly people can get on board with engaging. I feel like whenever you're limiting your um, meeting time to two hours a week, let's say, um, you have to have folks that are just right on board, can pick up where you left off, and just ready to jump back in the conversation. Jeremy, I have a question, if it's sure. okay to jump in here. Um, to find, given that you had these two different experiences with one in person, one online, one of the things that I feel ends up missing and this is me just projecting because I, I mean, for me, it's just orchestrating with different panelists for two, you know, it doesn't, I mean, it, it matters to me, but it doesn't matter to me. Like I'm still doing my job part of it. Um, but one of the things that I have always or often reflected on as being a major difference is that you're missing that informal socialization time when you're doing it online. That when we take breaks during the Zoom sessions, it's expected that it's 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, you're shutting your video off, you're shutting your audio off, you're doing something out in the rest of your home usually, and then you're going to come back together and re-engage. Whereas if it was in person, you would take those same breaks. And yeah, some people would go outside and catch up on their phone calls or text messages or whatever. 
Um, but there was also like the lunchtime that you miss. And so the, that kind of bonding that I think happens in person, which I think could sort of speak to what you were saying earlier about like times are just different that though that may be, that may be me being a little bit more of an old soul and assuming that you have to um, engage in person. But I feel like that's one of the pieces that I most miss doing these kinds of online sessions is that it's that informal piece of, I mean, even something as silly as like, oh, I noticed the car you pulled up and I used to have that, you know, I don't know. It's that element yeah. of the personal, even though we see into each other's homes, we don't, that's, that piece is missing. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. That piece is missing. I mean, that is uh, kind of the missing piece of 2020, I would say. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it has to come to this. Um, we'll see how we grow out of it. Um, mm -hmm. because, you know, we're going to move through it. Um, things are going to change. Things are going to evolve. That's just the human nature of things. Um, but yeah, I would agree that, uh, you know, when you're in person, you have more time to connect as a person, uh, with the people that you're around, but online, you do kind of miss that. You know, some people don't feel that they're capable of providing that type of collaboration, uh, on day one and maybe day two, but then they get, you know, we, you start getting into the, uh, you know, start getting into in the game and uh, you start realizing like uh, community development is you, you absolutely, no matter what your perspective or what your background is, because it's community development related, you are absolutely important and you should absolutely be at the table to have those conversations. Um, you know, but that's just uh, kind of like on you, on me, the panelist to kind of check your, check your ego and put it in control. Like uh, my ideas that I have the way that the country should run, that the city should be ran, the state should solve problems. I'm like, that's not going to fly for everybody. And everybody has to realize that everybody's got those same type of ideas and they need to realize that their ideas aren't going to work for everybody else. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about these types of panels is that you really quickly realize how different you are, even though it's just your neighbor that's on the other side of the street. It's about community getting involved with their democracy. And, uh, you know, that, that hopefully is the future of government. Well, that would be a fantastic place to end it. But I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. Which is just, we're, so we're recording this sort of in the middle of this Eugene process. They're about 10 hours in or so. Um, at this point, and uh, by the time we release it, they'll be, well, still sort of in the middle of it, in the middle of day two or three, if we were doing an in-person process. What would you say to somebody that was kind of in the middle of it at that stage, tons of information coming in, um, but still like some time left where there's going to be some hard conversations? What, uh, what advice would you have for people who are on the panel? Take a deep breath. Don't let it overwhelm you. Take it one step at a time um, and be open. Be open to uh, other perspectives. Uh, think about things that you, you personally wouldn't think about. Uh, understand that person that's sitting across on the other side of that table has uh, a different life background than you. And, uh, you know, have some sympathy for it and have empathy for all. So, yeah, but uh, I think the biggest tip would just take a deep breath and, uh, just keep moving. That's awesome advice for maybe all of us, especially right now. Jeremy and Kelly, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Lana Kelly. It's fun.